And this is where I always tell people, look, follow the money. It requires effort, it requires engagement, true engagement. You gotta say yes. Some way, somehow, say yes. That's where the innovation comes. We cannot be complacent. I'm gonna ask you something because I've got my own opinion, which I'll, I'll say after you give us an answer. What, what is, if everybody talks about superpowers, what, what do you think your superpower is? So I have an opinion on this. Huh. <laughs> Man, you just asked, you just opened a Pandora's <laughs> box there. <laughs> And because I because I should refrain from sharing my first my, off, you are an extremely humble person, so thank I you. know that that question, yeah, it, it internally it, when you're when a humble person is asked that question. So I guess let me rephrase it: the opposite of your blind spots. What do you seem to do really well at in business? Because we all have blind spots. We all have things that we we either have to outsource or rely on other people to really help us, right? So what are some of the things that you feel like you do really well that you can help lead others? Or, or even lead a business to new levels? Um, well, one thing, you know, I've focused on data for the last 30 years. Um, I think it's a little analogous to those old posters you used to see in the mall, those 3D posters. You remember those are just no, a bunch had, of dots? Had to kind of... You would walk around, you'd do like... <laughs> can't see anything. Did, did and somebody else to, would walk up to and go, oh, it's a spaceship. Do you remember the Seinfeld with that episode? Yes, <laughs> yes. So I'm the guy that can't see, like, I can't see anything uh, with the dots. But when it comes to data, when it comes to if somebody serves up, if I start working with their business or they start exposing me, say it's a salesperson, you know, that has a situation or somebody that's struggling with a personal situation or it's uh, a business that's looking to elevate to get up to that next level. Um, I have always seemed to have the ability to be able to see through the noise, see through the numbers, see through the personalities to really get to what the core opportunities are and to be able to assist somebody in connecting those dots so that they can move from where they are to where they ultimately want to be. And I think that's rooted in my desire to help or my desire to teach. You know, I, I, I really loved, uh, I've always loved training people. And as long as I've been in this business, I've really enjoyed the coaching and training aspect of it. <clears throat> my belief has always been that there's only two reasons that any human being, any one of us can't accomplish anything. And it's either a lack of will or it's a lack of ability. Right, so for example, I used to play tennis growing up and the only thing, the only thing that kept me from being a world-ranked tennis player is a general lack of ability, right? So, so if you have a lack you, of- You had the will. <laughs> if, if you have a lack of ability, you can be coached, you can be trained, and you can move up to 100% or close to 100% of your capabilities. But let's face it, if 100% of my capabilities isn't good enough to get beyond college, that's as far as I'm going to go, right? But a lack of will is a different thing. You know, when you can't you, coach a lack of will. You've got this Barry Bonds thing over here, right? Signed Barry Bonds thing with the gloves. And it's from his 500th home run. Let me tell you, when you watch baseball, because you're, you, you're, you know when you watch football, those guys are big. They're giants. Yeah. When you watch baseball, you see someone like Johnny Damon on TV, and you think, wow, that's a little, little guy. So I'm at the Kentucky Derby. Johnny Damon's there. He's bigger than I am. He's not little. No, he's not. And Steph I even Curry, told him that. same way. So, you know, you, you, I was in my um, involved with uh, the, the Warriors, and we own a, a we're partner in a restaurant group where his wife, Aisha, is, is part of it. And... The, you know, you see Steph, he's always the smallest guy in the court, he man. He looks tiny. So you it. think he's, he's like, what is he, 5'8", five, 5'9", five, and I meet him and I'm like, <laughs> yeah. like the kid's six foot two. Yeah. And built, six foot two. And I'm so like, you were talking about seven. ability. When you sit, if you're fortunate enough to sit, you know, right there near an on-deck circle, all right, you get an idea of the average size. These baseball players are giant. They're six foot four, Huge. they're 220 pounds. 
huge. they are big human beings and so and they're fast and they're athletic uh, and so and their arms are like my leg yeah so you and I when we might have loved to have gone on to play pro something there were some limitations. A, there a, were some limitations it's a different <laughs> level I, I asked uh, I asked Steve Young one time you know I had the good fortune of being involved with the 49ers for about a dozen years and I've lived a little bit of a Forrest Gump life, you know, where I've oftentimes found myself in situations that I thought... And we're going to talk about how that came about. I don't, I, I don't, I don't know how this happened, but I'm having a pretty good time. And um, I, so, but I asked him one time, what is the difference between college and the pros? And he said, you know, when you're in college, he said, you're facing, no matter how great the team you're facing... You know, if you're lucky, if they're lucky, one or two of the members of their team will make it to the pro level. Right. When you go to the pro level, it's the best player from the top, call it, what is it, there's 32 teams, so you call it, there might be 100 to 150 people that will make it through the draft onto the team of the tens of thousands of kids that were on these programs. And so he said the main difference is the speed. He said what happens is the speed of the game accelerates so greatly. And anybody that's out there that watches football and you watch a quarterback drop back, and how many times have you seen somebody who was a Heisman Trophy winner and never made it in the NFL? And what happened is they couldn't make that jump in terms of the speed being able to read a defense. Right. And you watch it, you've heard this. You snap the ball and it's 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, somewhere between 2.9 seconds, 3.9 seconds, the ball's out of your hand. Just think about that for a second. Oh, by the way, there's five guys here that are average 325 pounds running at you that are taller than you are. You've got people running all over the place, and you have to look, check, 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 bam, all in less than four seconds. Tim Tebow is a perfect example. Exactly. He's a superior athlete in college, and quite honestly, physical skills in the pros was as good. Without as question. Better. It's what allowed him to play for the time he did. Uh, but like you said, the speed of these defenses and being able to anticipate and, and being able to uh, react quick enough, not everybody can, can, can adjust to that. The, the, the Niners, and I'm sure like most teams, would have something called a war room, you know, when you had draft day coming up. And, would you? And, did you sit in those? Yeah, you'd sit in the war oh, room and you'd have, you, there's a big uh, conference room and you'd have boards for every position and they'd have every person ranked, every position ranked right in there and and you have people that uh, they wanted to potentially draft or potential trades or things of that nature um, and it's it's uh, incredible the level of thought uh, you didn't realize it until I had the opportunity to go into that room and, and be able to look around in that room you know back in the day I had the good fortune of of uh, uh, working with being introduced to the great Bill Walsh who you know was at a different level because there's good coaches, there's great coaches, and there's coaches like Bill Walsh. And what do I mean by that? Well, he spawned other great coaches, should right? Have been, Mike should have Holmgren, been a Cincinnati Bingo coach. Mike Holmgren <laughs> was was a Bill Walsh protege. So was Sam Weish. Yeah. So was uh, uh, was it Pete Carroll? Yeah. You know. So was Bill Belichick. Yeah. So I mean, that's a different level. And one of the things that was remarkable uh, to me about uh, that team and their processes was the value they put on intellect, not just your physical skills, but to your point, do you have the intellect to be able to understand the Bill Walsh system and to master that Bill Walsh system? Belichick. So you had to be one smart, intellectually a smart quarterback, which yeah. Steve Young was a very smart quarterback. You know, so was Joe Montana, was a very mm -hmm. smart guy. He wasn't the, he wasn't the biggest guy for sure, mm -hmm. but man, was he dead sharp. I, I feel like Joe Montana, <clears throat> and Tom Brady are probably very comparable in the sense that physically, well, you just look at their draft positions. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, neither of them were expected to be, and you could argue they're the top two quarterbacks of all time. Yes. <laughs> so, I, I don't think it'd be much of an argument. Yeah. Yeah. So. I think uh, six rings, five rings. Yeah. You know, that would do it, right? Yeah. So um, I think it's hard to argue that fact, but... It's a, it's, 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 I've always loved studying greatness in any, in, you know, any realm. I mean, you know, I, I had the good fortune, you know, being in Silicon Valley 
uh, at our store, you know, where, you know, customers like Steve Jobs, you know, uh, or um, David Packard, or Gordon Moore, who started Intel. I mean, who has customers like that? I mean, these You've are been, these are icons. Yeah. These are these are legends. They're world and changers. They are absolute world changers. And and to deal with uh, folks like that, you know, it, you really start to see some differences between good, great, and then iconic or legendary. What makes that that difference? And you know, and there's lessons, <clears throat> Scott. That you know to be learned everywhere. Success leaves clues. We hear that oftentimes. What do and you that, think makes the difference between some of the people you just mentioned compared to the great people? Because there is a level. I think just like you said in the sports, there's or coaches, there's great, and then there's a, a whole other level, and you have to put someone like a Steve Jobs in, in that category, right? So, what is that? What's that separator? You know, I I, I do think that there's. Um, there's such a thing as gener generational intellect or generational uh, talent, where you have this once in a generation, you know, kind of a Michael Jordan. Now, were there other great players, Larry Bird, Magic Johnson? You know, yes, tons of them. But there was one, yeah. one Michael Jordan that rose above. There is one Tiger Woods, yeah. you know, in our generation. There is one Steve Jobs. You know, there's a great book by uh, Malcolm Gladwell called The Outliers. You know, and, and, and it's a great book. I would highly recommend anybody go out there and read it because it really speaks to that somewhat. You know, he attributes some of it at least to circumstance, timing. For example, if you were to look at Bill Gates, uh, I believe it was Bill Gates, Larry Ellison, and Steve Jobs, they were all born within a short period of time of each other. Mm -hmm. And why, why did that mean anything? Why was it memorable? And collaborated. Well, well because if they were born five years later, the computers would have already been here. Yeah. They would have been late in the game. If they were born five years earlier, same brain, same intellect, same vision, it doesn't line up. And, but each one of them also in their own way, Steve Jobs, for example, you know, was not only born at the exactly that right time, but he had exactly that right brain, exactly that vision. He had that hunger, he had that curiosity. Um, and he happened to have a professor that let him use, you know, these monstrous computers that no kid was supposed to use at that time, you know, in college labs. And so, you know, that allowed him to get access to information and advance himself. Um, so I do think there's something to be said for the outlier. I do think there's something to be said for generational talent. But you know, when you look at in, within industries, like within the car business, for example, and you go, okay, well, you know, what makes the difference between you know good and great and then iconic? Well, I, I had said years ago, I had uh, come up with a saying that that was, uh, it's easier to climb Mount Everest than to live up there. Right, and if you think about that, <laughs> think about if you you know how many times we interviewed a salesperson and it said, "Hey, right. show me what you've done," and, and they were recording, and, and they they pull out you know the check stub from the best month of their life, you know, or you, you interview a sales manager and they tell you about the best month of their life, you know, but you know, can you achieve that that top level? Can you be number one, number one uh, Mercedes like Fletcher Jones has been number one Mercedes for? two and a half decades at least yeah. that's iconic that's that's epic you know so to say I'm number one for a month or I'm number one for a year phenomenal it's a phenomenal achievement but it's not epic right so there's a there's a difference there and it's about the ability to sustain Michael Jordan sustained Tiger Woods sustainable right sustainable success at the highest level Brian Benstock why is people why are they so interested in Brian and his team you know because if, if he was number one Honda or Acura store one time last year yeah. all right that's pretty good that's interesting what did you do but to be there year after year after the year after year and just like a sports team where if you win the Super Bowl Kansas City Chiefs yeah. and you think hey this is the start of a dynasty Kansas City Chiefs thought that great football team phenomenal quarterback you're no Tom Brady yet right because you've got to sustain it this guy's 43 years old right and 20 years later you know he still was able to get the job done yeah so he's I actually won more Super Bowls older in life now 
than when he was probably That's in his physical true. prime. That's absolutely true. Yeah. But here's another thing. You, you, people look at Tom Brady, whether you love him, like him, hate him, disagree with him, whatever it is, look at the regimen. Look at the discipline. Look at the commitment compared to the good and compared to the great. Yeah. How many great quarterbacks have gone to the degree with nutrition as Tom Brady? Yeah. You know what that number is? Zero. Yeah. Zero. TB12, if you said to any great quarterback, hey, go on to this guy's nutritional uh, approach for six months, they'd go, there's no way, man, there's no way. Or the great Jerry Rice, I used to ask Jerry when we were in training camp and he'd say, and by now it's sixth, seventh, eighth year in, he's already the greatest receiver, man, of all time. He's well on his way to the Hall of Fame. <clears throat> and he, sh he would show up at the mini camps. You wouldn't be surprised to see Jerry show up at a mini camp. That's for rookies, right? He'd show up first. He, when he wasn't working out at mini camp or before training camp open, the real camp open, there is this absolutely notorious hill in Silicon Valley. It's just an absolute. I've seen the I've seen the thirty or it'll the, break the it'll, it'll break this, a yeah. strong man or woman this hill. And he would Terrell run that every just... day. Terrell, yeah, I knew I met Terrell when he's a rookie. And you know, Jerry, Jerry would say, Come on up here. Same thing. It's like having Tom Brady say, You really? You wanna run? You're a rookie? You wanna hang out with me? All right. Well, you know, most of those people can't hang with him. Jerry, why why would you do that? He says, I wanna make sure I gotta make the team, man. He took nothing for granted. Tiger Woods, when he would get off the golf course, everybody else went in, maybe they grabbed a a beer, maybe a cocktail, maybe they just wanted to sit and hang out and shoot the bull, you know, post their, their uh, cards. Where'd Tiger go? Driving range. Yeah. You know, when did Michael show up for practice? First guy there. Who was the last one and everybody left? Michael was there. Yeah. So Steph Curry, if you see his his regimen, what the guy does and you wonder why, why he can shoot the way he does from not just three-point range, greatest shooter of all time, but take him out to 30 feet, he's, he's made more than any, any team combined. Yeah. 35 feet, he's made more than any team combined. He would sit out in the tunnel at the Oakland Arena where the players come out from the tunnels here. And you, you walk out from here to, I don't know, maybe twice the length of my wall, a little further than that. And then there's the court, and then there's the basket. And he would just practice from there. He'd practice from half court and his dribbling uh, techniques, if anybody uh, subscribes to Masterclass or just YouTube, Steph Curry dribble, and just watch what this guy does as he's, he's, he's juggling a ball, a tennis ball, as he's doing drills with this hand, or he's, dri he's dribbling with both hand, a, ball, a, a ball in both hands. It's just, it's a different level, Scott. And so business is no different. Right? How bad does somebody want it? I shared a story uh, not too long ago um, that that had, was shared to, uh, with me over two decades ago, and it never ever left me. And it went like this: a woman went to Carnegie Hall. True story. She went to Carnegie Hall. She was a pianist, an uh, amateur pianist, loved to play. Uh, but had never done anything professionally. But she went to Carnegie Hall, why? Because the greatest pianist of our time was playing and it was her favorite pianist. And she watched that concert. And after the concert, she made her way to the stage door and she waited and she waited and she waited because she wasn't gonna leave until she told this pianist how much, how much that concert meant. So he finally comes out the door and she says, oh my God, she says, you have no idea how long I've waited. She says, I've been waiting here. I was inside listening to your, to your concert. And it was absolutely spectacular. It moved me so much that I had to wait here all this time. I could not possibly leave without meeting you. And I just want to say, I would give anything to be able to play like you. To which she replied, no, you wouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> to which she replied, excuse me? Pardon? And he said, no, you wouldn't. He says, if you'd give anything to play like me, you'd play like me now. And he's not wrong. I mean, that's yeah. the truth. So people all the time will say, I want this, I want this, I would give anything. Would you? 
Would you? Do you get up at 4 a.m. or 4.30? You know, there's an old saying, you work 40 hours a week to survive. You work over 40 to succeed. So are you willing to get up before your kids get up so you can have that free time or whether you can get on the Peloton or whether you can read, whether you can assimilate information that's gonna change your mindset? You know, how much, I've asked this to people, how much have you invested in the last 12 months combined on yourself? You know, in terms of bringing in new information, investing in courses and programs, going back to school, going to a 10X conference or whatever it might be. You know, people come up with so many excuses. I don't have time. Okay, well then you don't have time to elevate, to go from good to great or great to epic. You know, if you're a dealership, how much are you, how, are you, how committed are you? to growing your people? Do you have a formal training? How many dealerships have a formalized training program where people are getting trained every day? Whether you like, love, hate, or dislike, or don't agree with Grant Cardone, sales meeting every single day, suit up every day. Are you gonna see anybody? Probably not, suit up. And you show up every day, and that sales meeting's happening every day, and there's accountability every single day. The truth is people perform better when they know the expectations of them. And how many people do you know that work in an organization and they don't even know what's really expected from them? Mm -hmm. I find it fascinating that we've brought in so much technology and evolution into dealerships, for example. And in the 70s, the average salesperson sold 10 cars a month. What was it in the 80s? Probably 10 to 12. What was in the 90s? 10 to 12. <laughs> what was in the 2000s? 10 to 12. Yeah. I think it's picking up now, but I think that's... Those are outliers. Take it easy. Yeah. They're, they're, hey, everybody yeah, not take the average. Easy. I don't want to say the average. Take it easy. Simmer down. There's some outliers right. out there who have taken advantage of social media, but they are outliers. And the average is probably still the 10 to 12. Yeah, there is. You know, and, and there's a number of reasons for that, but it's like any other industry has brought efficiency yeah. and greater productivity, and that hasn't necessarily happened. So if you happen to be in a dealership to where you're still selling 10 or 12, hmm, you ought to probably take a really hard look because you could be doing more. You see somebody like Ali Rita, right, who sold over 1,500 cars by himself. By the way, not Toyotas, not Hondas, Cadillac in Detroit, right? So this isn't LA, this isn't Manhattan, this is Cadillac. He sells more Cadillacs then Cadillac stores sell Cadillacs. You think about it, 125 new Cadillacs. How many Cadillac stores sell 125 new a month? Correct. That's a short list, man. Yeah. But yet, you have to say like Roger Bannister, Ali Rita's doing it. So, <laughs> and there's other people that are selling 40, 50, 60, 70 a month. So is 10 or 12 really okay? So this is where I was going when I asked you the superpower question. And you brought up Brian Benstock, so I'll put him in this category too. <clears throat> And I really think anybody that has accomplished great things, there's, so I'm interviewing a lot of great people. I've interviewed Grant, I've interviewed Brad Lee, I've interviewed, I'm just, Tom Bullitt comes to mind, right? Um, from Bullitt Bourbon. Yep. And so I see a lot of people that are great visionaries, but they don't execute well. I see a lot of people that execute well but they don't have great vision. I'm not talking about the people I've interviewed. If they don't execute well and they're great visionary, they're smart. The, the great ones are smart enough to make sure they have someone that can execute. But what I think separates something that makes you and Brian unique and the people like you is you have both. So you're able to execute, you have great vision and your proof of your vision is all the different things you've done. It, it isn't isolated to, you can't have great vision. You can have great vision, I think, but you have multiple industries and you've gotten into a lot of different things successfully. Um, and the whole reason I stole our headline for this episode, right? Pretty much from your clubhouse bio, I thought, well, hell, that's a, that's a good, I'm going with that headline. You know, how to create new revenue streams and scale your business like a pro. You use the word create instead of start mm -hmm. because there's a difference between starting a business you can take any idea 
and just start a business. But the word create implies I'm creating a business that maybe didn't even exist. From thin air. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. That takes great vision. Brian, is a, he has great vision, right? But you guys, you don't accomplish what you've accomplished without, be, without being great leaders and executing on it, on those ideas. And so you were just talking about, you know, uh, I think there are a lot of people with good ideas and have the idea and believe some of the things they're seeing that could take that average from 10 to 12 to 15, 20, 25, 30, but they don't execute on it. I, I agree with that, Scott. I, you know, I, you know, and I, I know it's hard I, to talk I, about. I, it, yourself. it is, and I certainly because I got to be really careful here because I bring up people that I admire, like Steve Jobs, and who, by the way, was the least nice person in the world. Man, he was a terrible, terrible customer. I've seen that. I've he was seen a that tough movie. customer, man. He was so tough, but he was so demanding. But he was so fair in how tough he was, uh, or how rough he was at times. His consistency was unwavering. But you know, you look at somebody like Brian, you know, where he has a great vision um, and he executes well. And I think, I think, I've often said that you know people will fall in love with the idea of getting engaged. You see people when they get engaged, oh man, is that exciting. They get engaged and you're on tour and everybody wants to have a piece of you and let's have an engagement party, let's get together, let's toast, let's have a cocktail, or whatever, right? But are they in love? Are they just as in love with the idea of being a husband? I don't know. I don't think so all the time. It's you might be in love with it. the idea of having a baby. Are you in love? with the idea of being a dad, being a parent. There's a difference, mm -hmm. right? Between even father and dad, there's a difference and you know that. So sometimes people fall in love with the idea of being an entrepreneur, but are they in love with putting in the work? Right. You know, and I think that's the difference. When you look at a Brian Benstock, he is equally passionate, convict, has equal conviction, commitment, and is equally in love with creating a vision mm -hmm. that's gonna allow him to live up on Mount Everest as he is in putting in the work. Yes. He loves that part too. Yes. I love the work. Yeah. I, you know, I used to say to, I was just saying to somebody a week ago, if I wasn't married and I didn't have my wives over here, my, my wife and my kids, yeah. you know, I probably honestly would never take a vacation. I don't get it, you know what I mean? Because somebody fortunately put it in my head years and years ago that rule number one is do what you love to do. Because if you do what you love to do, your work is your play and your play is your work, right? Well, there is no work life balance. It seems it's it's integrated, right? No, it's in a, you don't do what balance. Right. They're all this. They all, all work the together, right? Yep. So it's you, you're not part of that crowd to where oh my god, okay, it's five o'clock. Fred Flintstone whistle blows. Let's go <laughs> have some beers, right? You know, thank God it's Friday. Sydney behind the scenes doesn't understand the, the Fred Flintstone reference. No, I, do, I understand it. Yeah, hey, Wikipedia <laughs> or Google it, yeah. Fred Flintstone, but. But, you know, anyways, it's that mentality that you work in the factory or you work in your dealership or you work whatever it is you're doing at a restaurant and, and the whistle blows essentially, meaning the shift is over. All right, thank God it's Friday. Think about that statement, that term, that cliche, thank God it's Friday. Well, you know, what it infers is that thank God I'm done getting through this week. Well, when's the last time that you loved doing what you were doing? You say, thank God I don't get to do that anymore. You know what I say? And I mean this. I say, thank God it's Monday. Oh, I, I have a, I I have a, a picture I put I want up to get now to a it. TGIM. Mm -hmm. uh, and I only did it because <laughs> I did it to annoy some of my friends. <laughs> and, and then it caught on a little bit. But I enjoy Saturday and Sunday for opposite reasons. Same. And you know why? It's the only day that the rest of the office is kind of off and I don't get bombarded with emails. I don't get bombarded with things and, and calls that take me away from the bigger projects. I use, I work, I mean, I, I work Saturday and Sunday and I look forward to them because I know it's uninterrupted time for me. It's space. Correct. 
it gives you the time and the space to think and to breathe. And, you know, I love being a super engaged uh, partner to my wife. I love being a super engaged dad uh, to my two little guys. I'm on fatherhood 2.0, these two little guys right here. <laughs> This is fatherhood 1.0, my daughter and my son. I've got a 37-year-old daughter, 34-year-old son, and I've got a six and a four-year-old. So anytime anybody tells me, bragging they're a big-time athlete or triathlete, Ironman, I said, tell you what, tell you what, tough guy, come over to my house. Yeah. Why don't you hang out with my two little guys, right? I've got a Category 5 hurricane, and i got a Category 4 tornado, right, which have two speeds. They're either full tilt or sleeping. Yeah. That's it. And come hang out with these two dudes and let me know how you're doing three hours from now. Yeah. Right? I love it. It's very it, it's energizing to me. It's exciting. But but you're right, in that period of time you also get some space. You get to kind of tune out the noise a little bit. And you have those rare instances like you do at five or five thirty in the morning, yeah. where you have space to think. Because once you once you get on that treadmill yeah. of work whatever whenever that starts for you and however it starts for you all of a sudden you're dealing with all kinds of disruptions distractions and noise as you're trying to stay on pace and that's something else that's really important to acknowledge because if you don't have the ability to have um, to be able to concentrate on that which is truly vital and important you will very easily get knocked off course, get distracted. You may, it may not stop you from getting there, but it's definitely gonna cause you to have obstacles more often, challenges more often, and, and to have it slow down the amount of time, uh, you know, or, or, or how long it takes for you to get there. So I think it's, it's really important to have that single-minded focus and where do you get that single-minded focus? Well, oftentimes it's fueled from that Saturday and Sunday, yeah. right? Where you get that space. I don't know about you, but I'm a list guy. You know, if you look at my notes app, it's literally got thousands of, of you know, I create notes and lists for everything. Or I would take the legal pad, uh, or now I use the Remarkable tablet, and I write lists. And I always have my most important three because I know that there's going to be distraction, distractions every day, but I'm not going to let it knock me off my top three. I won't. So I just created, I didn't create it, I copied Donald Miller's productivity schedule. I don't know if you've ever written or mm -hmm. uh, read his books. He does a great job. You look, I know we, we both have a common like for Jay Abraham's materials. Yeah, so you'll, you'll like his stuff as well if, if you do that. So it's about building a story brand. There's a lot of overlap and similarities there. It's about keeping a clear message and he's talking, at some point he had a lead magnet. At, at some point it was this productivity schedule which I downloaded uh, because he works his day differently. So I write, I start each day with following his, this is his, to his credit, I follow, I have five things, and it doesn't have to be up to, up to five things, I want to make sure that if I look back on the day, I did these things. And my five things, and these are overall type things, I want to be, have good focus, I want to pray, I want to finish strong, alright? So in other words, I, I used to start a lot of projects that didn't always finish, right? So I want to finish strong. And, and then I've got a couple more in there. But then I'll write down my appointments and I'll write down the things that if I accomplish what I, I want to do in my projects, these are the things I'm going to enjoy today. So it's not, a, I have to remind myself, I'm not giving up all these things. I'm, I'm doing it all, right? I write down what my why and my mission statement is. I then do my to-dos. And then my last one is the three projects I want to make sure I get done. Now, I rarely get three. If I get one, I'm happy. But I always got to get, I have to finish one of them. And these are big projects. Uh, so, you know, it might, one might be, all right, I've got to write an entire email sequence. We've got a, a webinar coming up or some type of marketing strategy that takes it through the entire tree and funnel system. You know, that takes a lot of time. And so, and by the way, you talk about doing things you don't always enjoy. I, I can't stand that. So that's <laughs> something I have to, I, I have to, Tray, I have to get someone else in here that has the same philosophy to help me with that. Um, but that's an example of a project. So I've went and reversed. 
my to-do list, there could be plenty of things that are important to do on there, but they're not as important as that project. Yeah. And, and so, and it's a different mentality. So there's plenty of projects. And what I have found, because there's also an appointment schedule on there, I'm scheduling less appointments because I've found I keep saying yes to too many people. And, it's and a disease. I don't have time because you don't want to disappoint anybody. And I, I don't have time to do, get my projects done. Yeah. It's a disease. I think it's one of the, one of the hardest things to master is to learn how to say no. You know, it's, um, it, it, I remember, uh, and anybody could look this up, I'm sure, on YouTube, but it was a, an interview that involved Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. And Warren Buffett, you know, to some degree took Bill Gates as if he needed, you know, a tremendous amount of help, but he kind of took him under his wing, so to speak. And, um, and Bill Gates, I mean, Warren Buffett is well known uh, for uh, just being an absolute voracious reader. You know, I mean, he just spends hours the a day of books, reading, yeah. right? And Bill Gates is is similar. If you, uh, there's a great, I want to say it was a three part documentary, possibly on Netflix on Bill Gates. And if you simply saw not just the volume of books that Bill Gates reads, but how substantive. Like I, I'll never forget that one of the books was, I think it was the Minneapolis, Minnesota budget. Read it, right? Just, just assimilates at a rate that goes beyond an average human. But the reason I brought these guys up is, in an interview at some point, Bill Gates was uh, reaching for Warren Buffett's uh, like appointment book, and it was largely blank. <laughs> and, and he said, you know, basically there's nothing in here. There's not very many appointments in here. And to which Warren Buffett replied, listen, I can buy anything I want. I, you know, I've got all the money, he says, except for time. Yeah. I can't buy time. So he learned years ago to say no, to afford himself the time every single day, that space that you and I love, we crave on a Saturday or Sunday, mm -hmm. he's afforded himself the ability to have that level of time every day. And you sit here and ask yourself, what would, where would you be? You know, where would your knowledge be? Because it's, it's said, somebody said it uh, years ago, and this is true, that you could, you could pick up a book on a subject that you know nothing about. And if you read simply one page a day, after five years, you would be considered a subject matter expert, and after seven years, you would be considered one of the world's leading authorities. Can you imagine? Yeah. You don't know a single thing about it, one page a day. So imagine where you would be, or I would be, or any of us. I mean, there's a difference between great and iconic, is having the ability to say no, to afford yourself the space and time, not even on a Saturday and Sunday, during the week, mind you. To be able to, to afford to take in new information that's going to make you better at what you do. Yeah. That's, a, that's I think it's incredible. Let me ask you something. So, first off, you brought up some great teachers that you had in your past. You, do you, obviously, you had mentors along the way. Do you have any now? Yes. I think that every person... Um, any high performer I've ever met has coaches and has mentors. I don't know where anybody got it in their brain. Maybe it's the fact that we get through high school and we graduate. <clears throat> or for those who went to college, I did not. We graduate. And I've graduated. I'm done. You didn't graduate? No, sir. Neither so did I. I, um, I graduated from high school. Uh, I no, too. no problem there. I actually did it on an accelerated fashion because I was so excited to work and I really needed to work in my upbringing. That was really not an option. Um, my father left us when we were young. My mom had five kids. He never paid a dollar in alimony, not one dollar. Um, and just uh, largely abandoned us. Um, and my mom, you know, had to do what a mom has to do. She went and got a job during the day. She went and started taking uh, courses at night at a, to get a two-year degree. 
She worked multiple jobs, um, had an absolutely phenomenal attitude. She is my original mentor, my original coach. She, she taught me not to, uh, not to allow any other person to, uh, to define who I am. Um, don't sanction things from people just because they say them doesn't mean it's true. Um, she taught me, um, you know, to trust everybody until they give you three reasons not to, where most people are the opposite. Yeah. You know, they, they will, uh, I will trust you. And if you give me three distinct reasons not to, I still won't vilify you. I won't wish bad things. I just can't be friends with you. I asked where, that question. Where she was the opposite. I mean, most people are the opposite. They don't trust people until they give them three reasons to trust I them. asked that question right. the other day in Clubhouse because I was curious. Do you start off, you know, I just asked the kind of the audience, do you start off trusting people or are you the type of person everybody. that doesn't? And I, I think starting off with the trust, I love that. I trust everybody. And it's been a huge gift of mine because... I'm the guy, I'm not the nightmare on the airplane that you're sitting next to and he starts yapping at you, but I kind of am. Um, kind of am. In all fairness, if you don't have, you know, AirPods or something plugged in, chances are, you know, you're going to hear me say, so what's your story? I mean, that's what I'm going to say. Hi, I'm David. So what's your story? It's not the guy you're sitting next you know? to that that bothers. You know? It's the guy sitting in front of you. Yeah, probably. <laughs> but I have met some extraordinary human beings in situations that most people wouldn't have even known that that human existed. And that's been a huge gift of mine. I've learned so much through those people. So my mom was my original mentor. She taught me to, to you know not to tolerate a woman's point of view, but to respect it and appreciate it and understand it and, and understand the power within it. And, you know, she taught me to, you know, let and live, let live, live and let live, you know, as long as people were being respectful, I don't care what your politics are. I, you know, you, you could vote for who you want, do what you want, have whatever ideals, as long as it's not hurting anybody. You know, my mom taught me that. And, and so I have, but I had other mentors along the way. I was so fortunate in my young auto career to get exposed to a guy named Brian Tracy. And Brian Tracy ended up being Nightingale Conant's number one uh, speaker, right? And I had the opportunity to hang out. Can you imagine with Brian Tracy? I got a chance to be a, a Brian Tracy facilitator or coach at that time. I got the chance to hang out with a Jay Abraham you know, in my, in my late twenties, yeah. right? Early thirties, whatever it was, I, you know, I had a chance to uh, be, to be able to interact and interface with these, these uh, icons of business and be able to sit down and talk to them. I had the chance to sit down with Bill Walsh and to ask questions. But then, you know, I also learned the value of having mentors or coaches that are people around you. And the biggest thing that I've learned is that, listen, you know, you don't, none of us have enough time to spend with the people that are dearest with us. None of us have the time to spend with people that we would love uh, to get more time with. So how do, you, how do you allocate a minute of your day with somebody who's negative or, or somebody who is uh, downtrodden or somebody who uh, doesn't wish good things for people? Or it's just it's it's it is emotionally exhausting. It's fatiguing, and so. But if you don't do that, it's kind of like, you know, taking a page from Warren Buffett, no pun intended, and affording yourself the time to think and have space and read. Well, you got to afford yourself the time to be able to choose very wisely who you invest your time with, and so. I've always looked at it as being able to create, everybody I believe should have a council of mentors, right? I believe every child should have that council of mentors. Every adult should have a council of mentors. So I have people and my mentors or coaches are people that have attributes um, that I admire, that I respect and I would love to be able to, um, uh, to be able to grow in myself. I've always mentioned to people, if they ever said, hey, you know, it's your birthday coming up, what do you need? You don't need anything. The only thing I've ever asked for is give me your favorite book. Give me a book that literally transformed you, that changed you. 
Yeah, I, I, I just think it's really important that everybody has a council of mentors. I've always had coaches. I've always had mentors. Um, because to me, if you don't have a coach or a mentor, then isn't that kind of inferring that you hit your pinnacle? Yeah. And I don't care whether you're 18 or 25 or 45 or 70. I don't ever want to hit my pinnacle. I, I, I've been saying my whole life, I'm a student of this industry and I will never, ever graduate. For the people who listen, how do you define a mentor? Is it someone that, all right, can you be my mentor? Or is it more or less <laughs> someone you rely on that you know when you text or call and ask a question, they give you, you, you can rely on them to give you good advice? Uh, I, I think that's a friend yeah. in my book. You know, okay. We all have people that we can <clears throat> call or text at 2 in the morning. I got to ask you, what are you doing at two in the morning? <laughs> but that you need to call or text somebody. But but we all have those people that you know. My car broke down. It's midnight. It's snowing outside. Would you come and get me? Sure, absolutely. You know that's a friend. You know a mentor is somebody in my mind that yes, you can call on. They may not be available on demand. Let's be honest. Yeah. But but you can call on them, and you could fully expect to get honesty. To get, to get authenticity, um, you can expect to be held accountable, and you could expect that by virtue of that interaction to be elevated. So coaching, can, not cheerleading. Yeah. Um, so you know, can you say that of your friends? You might have a great friend. Uh, you would hope they would be authentic. I would hope so. I'd expect that of my friends that they would be honest. But let's be real. Sometimes our friends aren't honest. Hey, do I look good in this? You look great. You're, you're, what are you talking about? You have beer goggles on. What are you talking about? So, you know, that's, that sometimes they're very kind with not being honest. But will every interaction elevate you? No, that's not necessarily the role. But as a mentor, I yes. If you're my mentor, I would expect every time that I had the opportunity that I was so fortunate to engage with you or interact with you, I'm going to walk away better. I'm going to walk away uplifted. I'm going to walk away elevated, but, you know, relative to the state I was in before I had the chance to have that interaction.